Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, uh, welcome everybody to the third workshop already of the series of online workshops entitled Digital Archiving, Challenges and Opportunities of Archiving Social Media Data in the Context of Crisis Events. This series is about discussing theoretical, methodological, and practical aspects of social media archiving, and it's been designed to support an initiative of creative, creating a telegram archive of the war in Ukraine. It is organized and co-organized by the University of Bern, University of Zurich, the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe, and Alfred Landecker Foundation. The people behind the organizational team are Mikola Mahortek, Alexandra Urman, Desire Friedrich, Taras Nazaruk, Bogdan Shumilovich, Victoria Panas, Marianna Mazurak, um, and Miani Bagumian. It is a great honor for me to welcome our speaker, Niels Brugger, today. Uh, professor Brugger is a, a professor in media studies at Aarhus University, Denmark, in the School of Communication and Culture. His research interests are web historiography, web archiving, and media theory. He has authored and co-edited a number of publications, among others, The Archived Web, Doing History in the Digital Age, The Sage Handbook of Web History, Web 25, Histories from the First 20 Years of the World Wide Web, and he's co-founder and managing editor of the international journal called Internet Histories, Digital Technology, Culture, and Society. Um, thank you again so much for agreeing to be part of this initiative, for accepting our invitation, for taking the time and um, sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, it is really a great pleasure to have you today. I'll stop with the intro now. I'll give the words to our Ukrainian colleagues who want to say maybe a few words, and then we can proceed with the presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ani. Uh, thank you, Mikola, uh, for the introduction and in general uh, for the uh, for the organizing this workshop series. It's really uh, a great pleasure to have this uh, opportunities uh, for for the discussion. Thank you, Professor Brugger, for joining us today and for giving a talk. It's actually a great pleasure to have you here because. Uh, the very initiative of Telegram archiving uh, of the war in Ukraine basically started for us at the Center for Urban History in Lviv uh, in late February this year. I guess it was the last days of February when I wrote uh, an email to you and I contacted you asking for some uh, consultancy about web archiving, about social media archiving, because uh, uh, basically here at the center, we didn't have any previous background or training in doing social media archiving. And uh, this was kind of emergency initiative that we just started from scratch. And this was very useful to have this, uh, uh, this opportunity to uh, contact people who are more experienced in this, uh, who have uh, uh, their own projects in social media archiving. And this initiative uh, basically started from that, from asking other people, you and other people, about how to do that. Uh, so now we're, we are basically a few months afterward, after that, and we've been collecting this uh, um, online uh, social media content from the Telegram, which is one of the most popular pl social media platforms in Ukraine at the moment and very relevant for when it comes to the context of the war. Uh, and we, uh, by doing this, by collecting this material, we still keep uh, facing a lot of uh, different theoretical, methodological, practical, technical, legal challenges uh, related to that. So uh, it is, uh, again, it is really uh, important for us to have this uh, workshop series and this opportunity to learn from other uh, from other projects and other expertise. So we are very much looking forward to uh, to your talk, which is uh, from the very topic, from the very subject, sounds very resonating to what we're doing here at the Telegram, the Telegram project. I don't know, maybe Bodan want to add some words uh, for, to that? Or... I, I can only add that I, I am a colleague of Taras. Uh, Professor Brugger doesn't know me, but uh, I know about him <laughs> more. more. <laughs> <laughs> so when he was asking, uh, when Taras was asking uh, people like you about the help of uh, uh, 
archiving uh, social media, I was asking uh, other professors in the field of uh, kind of making ego documents, like how to collect diaries of war or dreams of war together with students. And plenty of materials that we collected within this another initiative, uh, which is not collecting social media, but to collect the responses of students to social media, how they actually have uh, lived through the early stages of war uh, using social media. Because many of our students couldn't really uh, watch news or, uh, you know, active. Uh, my colleague opened the uh, microphone. So, yeah, sorry for this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, our other projects, they are. Uh, they have a bit different focus, so they aim to collect uh, kind of more personal stories, but they are all, to some extent, are connected to internet archiving or social media archiving also. So I, I'm also looking forward uh, to have your presentation and thank you very much for agreeing and thank you very much to the University of Bern for organizing. Yeah, thank you very much, all three of you, for your very kind words. So uh, I hope I can live up to your expectations. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's 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 a pleasure if I can do anything that can be helpful for you in any any in, in any way, as I did with Harris when you when you just approached me, and I could send you sort of pipeline you to different other important persons. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy to help with that. But I have prepared a presentation and I think I'll just share my screen and then off we go. I think I'll be talking for half an hour, a little bit more maybe, and then we can just uh, chat as long as you as you would like to. Um, I would probably, I would like to stop a uh, quarter to four if that's possible. Uh, yesterday, my wife, she turned uh, 60 and uh, we're going to celebrate that later this, uh, this afternoon. So, so that's why. So, uh, and, and Zoom is so much out of my mindset, actually, because we haven't, we have been in the real life uh, in Denmark since February. No face mask, no nothing. We've just been out there since February. <laughs> so I'm a little bit rusty on, on Zoom, but I will try to kind of remind me how it worked. <laughs> so, and... So now you can see my slides, okay? Good. So, uh, so this is what I called my, my, my talk here, archiving online events, some theoretical, some mythological, and some practical challenges. So that's sort of going to be the overall agenda. But first I'd like to talk a little bit about digital media, social media, and online media, just to, in a way, say where my main focus is. You talked about Telegram, which is of course uh, very, very important, but maybe, the scope could be broader as well. Uh, and then I am going to focus, and that's the more theoretical part, uh, what is a media event? Um, so a few slides about that. Then I will focus on some general characteristics of online digital media, followed by the methodological challenges for archiving digital online media during a, an unplanned event, which to some extent at least, uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine is, and then some practical challenges. So this is, uh, this is the agenda. So uh, let's just get started. So digital and media, social media, online media. Uh, as, as I just sort of hinted a little bit at, my focus is not on, on social media. Uh, maybe I should also mention that I'm, <clears throat> I'm not working as, as, um, as a web archiver or something like that. My background is in, in research, so I consider myself as Annie also mentioned, a, um, a, a web historian. So my background is within the social science and humanities. And I've been studying the history of the web uh, since around 2000. And when I did that, then I could see that I had to archive it because it just disappeared. And that's for how, in a way why I drifted into web archiving at all. So that was a little bit of my background. So I'm not an, a web archivist, but a, a, a researcher, a web historian. But anyway, um, so, um, my, my approach is a little bit broader because I come out of a web history and web archive. So if you mean Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok, when you talk about social media, 
uh, I would make it a little bit broader in terms of the definition. So I would say social media may not be the, the best term in a way. That's the one we use in our daily life. But I would rather go for uh, something like digital online media because social media, all social media are digital online media, but not all digital online media are social media. Because, uh, as I put it in this uh, bullet here, the web is still out there and you should really not forget that because the web, it still is a key factor in the, in the, what I call the communicative infrastructure of our society. The web is still used, of course, now in tandem with many social media, but it is, it is still there. So I would say that could be, uh, as I put it here, a plea for not forgetting the World Wide Web and for adopting what I would call a more ecological perspective on, uh, on digital media. By that, I mean that in many cases, it is difficult to understand uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., without also including the web, because in many, in many uh, posts on, on social media, there is a link to the World Wide Web. And on the web, there are many, many, many links to social media. So I would rather go for a sort of a more ecological perspective where you where, where we should try to get as much of what I what you could call the communicative um, ecolo ecological system as possible where social media is one part the web is another part so uh, uh, yeah that's basically what I put in this bullet here uh, because the media are the social media the digital so digital online media are embedded in each other in very very complex ways so if you only in a way pull out one of them then you would probably miss all that was linked to for instance if that uh, if that's on the web so uh that was a little bit about sort of the key term social media and online uh, online media, on the online digital media so next uh, main point is about media events uh, and uh, here i have put it a theory of online media events which is very very <laughs> too much to promise because i'm just going to rephrase a few words from uh, from this book here uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you probably know it, called Media Events. It's an old book uh, by Daniel Dayan and Elihu Katz. Um, and it's from the beginning of the 90s, but it's still worth uh, reading in many ways. So, um, so I, I sort of went back to that. And as I put it here, this is the book to start with if you want to do something about media events. So what I'm going to do is to see a media events uh, as it is described by Dayan and Katz in this book. Uh, but then sort of move it to the digital media environment. So uh, before starting uh, talking about events and events in media, in a way we have to have the backdrop in place and, and the backdrop of events is always the everyday life. So everyday life is anything we do without thinking about it. It's also our, all our routines, all our repetitions. We get up, we do things, we do that, we do that. Um, and, and the event is everything that breaks with the routines and the repetitions. So we have to have this distinction between sort of everyday life in the broad sense of the word, and then the event that is whatever breaks with that. Um, and that can be uh, from the very individual everyday life, which we have in our family and our workplace to a more societal uh, routines. We have routines in society as well, and they can be broken as well. And that will also constitute a, an event. So on the individual level, birthdays, weddings, uh, national sport and cultural events would be more so societal, or it could be wars, or it could be disasters that in many, many ways break our routines and our daily life. So that's sort of a, a first kind of approach to what is an event after all. So, um, so these uh, events um, and the everyday life has always been embedded in media. We cannot, ex we cannot describe any, any type of social interaction without also including something about media. And I also consider the spoken word as a medium. So sociality is not possible if we don't have spoken language. Later on in, in the media history, we have writing, we have print, film, radio, television, and now the internet and on other online digital media. So what uh, Diane and Katz focus on in their book is a uh, specific um, topic which they call media events. It's a very, very specific genre to them within one specific medium only, namely, namely television. Um, 
And that sort of limits their, their use of the term media event because it is exclusively um, kind of identified with a specific genre within television. So what I have tried to do in an article, I'm going to mention the article later on, is to sort of see how much of their definition of media events as a televised, televised genre can be used if we move to the web. So um, I'm not going to go more into detail in, in Diane and Katz's very, very complex books in many ways, but just to show this typology that can be useful for you to have in mind, uh, a typology of events, which they do not formulate in the book, but based on what they actually write, you can sort of, in a way, reconstruct um, this, uh, this typology. So two things you can have in mind here. Uh, if we take the top first of this, uh, of this small table here. Events, they are usually either pre-planned or they can be unplanned. A pre-planned -pre event is say Eurovision uh, song contest that we know that it's taking place and we know when it, where, when it takes place. Unplanned events, we have lots of them, of course. A war is definitely one of them. Natural disasters, uh, terrorist attacks and stuff like that. But it's also, it, it's very important also when you're going to talk about how you can archive it to know, okay, which type are we actually dealing with? Do we know that it will happen? Do we not know that it will happen? And then on the, uh, on the, on the left side, we have another distinction between if it's light and re live and remote, that is, if it's taking place out there somewhere in the real world, so to say, or it could be made in the studio. So for instance, the Eurovision contest would be a pre-planned event that is taking place in a studio. Whereas um, uh, Olympics, for instance, could be a pre-planned event that is live and remote. So what Diane and Katz talk about when they talk about this televised media events as a genre is only things that have been pre-planned and that is taking place out there, but is highly scripted for television. So I'm not going to go more in detail I was in, with it uh, because I would, uh, in a way, just use it to show you this this table here, which can be relevant for you to have as well when, once you're starting, starting thinking about what is an event and what, how can we sort of prepare for that. So uh, now I am going to go to my, my third point about uh, the general characteristics of online digital media. It, of course, it's extremely difficult to say something reasonable about what characterizes all types of digital online media, but I, I'll give it a try anyway. Um, because it's important to have these characteristics of digital online media uh, in mind because they add a number of challenges to how we can understand a media event, also in Diane and Katz's uh, conceptualization, and then again, how we can preserve it. So in a way, the way that, or the, the characteristics of online digital media sort of expands uh, how, we can, how we need to conceptualize media events. So that's basically what I'm going to, to uh, just... Uh, percent now. So um, one of the things that is important with, with, with online uh, digital media is that uh, who can get involved in, in the event using these types of media. Again, if you have television, um, Olympics in 1990 something uh, used for television, there were not that many that could sort of get into that media event. But that's totally different with, with, with uh, online digital media now because um, if events that are not dependent on the media, they can rapidly become part of the mediated circuit because everyone can report from any event. And that's definitely what you have experienced in the, the Ukrainian war, but also in going back, I would say to the terrorist bombings in London, that was one of the first events where video was used to sort of already be published while the event was actually unfolding. People were posting videos from uh, when they were sitting in the tube and waiting what was happening uh, with, this, with this terrorist attack. Um, so that at least is a very, very important characteristic of online digital media because uh, the number of potential participants in the event uh, is simply just growing uh, very, very rapidly. And that's, that's important to know once you want to archive it. Um, and, and that, of course, is another way of saying that the number of positive producers um, and this also the increased speed and the increased complexity of the communication in a, even if it's a planned event, uh, can sort of affect that event and then make it in a way to an unplanned event. So if you have planned, say, 
uh, yeah, again, a sports event could be uh, maybe interesting to, to focus on here as a pre-planned event. And then people start doing things like they post uh, on social media during it, during it, during the event. Then they may change it, and thing may, things may happen that they may then affect the event. Um, so potentially, in a way, uh, all events tend to become more unplanned than they were initially, and that also goes for the ones that were actually pre-planned. And that is is one of the kind of the, the results of, of the characteristics of uh, online digital media. There's also a thing about uh, size here, because uh, in Diane and Katz's book, they only focus on what we could call big events, huge events like coronations of, of, uh, of, the, of the British uh, Queen, et cetera, things like that. But now um, we have a new kind of sort of embeddedness of, of the unplanned and small scale events that can sort of be nested into the big events. So there is something going on here that if we have a small or a big event, could be the Ukrainian war as well. And in that we have lots and lots and lots of smaller events taking place in different cities, different places, and they can sort of become part of the big event. But they may also become events in their own right. So we have something here with the size, um, because in the good old days when it was only television, an event was basically big, and that was it. But now we have a scale going from very, very small events to very, very big events, and then anything in between, and they can sort of be nested into each other. Again, that is important to have in mind once you want to archive. Um, yeah, that was basically what I was saying here, that we, of course, had that before. We had smaller events before, but now because they are mediated in the digital media circuit, then they can sort of become bigger events, although they started as smaller events. We had a lot of experiencing of that uh, in the Ukrainian war and also in other kind of disasters where people's own reporting from these events suddenly become sort of an, a small event in its own right because they could report it and then it was then connecting to the bigger event. So there is something about, uh, the first slide was about who, who could uh, sort of take part in the event. This is about the size of the event. So, I have two more uh, points to make here. The, uh, the third one here is about temporality of the event. Because uh, online social media adds a new kind of temporality to the events. Because when it was in television and it was a big event, it took place here and now. And that was basically it. But now we have the archiving capacity of the online social media combined with an easy search and an easy way of retrieving old media stuff. So this means that uh, we can have a sort of a seamless and ongoing continuous activation during the event of things that took place the day before, the day before, or maybe a year or 10 years ago, because it is also in the digital realm. So we can sort of, we sort of have a, as I put it in, in, in the slide here, we have a sort of historical dimension that can sort of be embedded in, in the event and during the event. And it can also uh, help the event to continue even after it has actually ended, because we still then have a historical trace of it also in social media and on the web. So there is something going on with events nowadays uh, in terms of time, because it comes with another temporality. On the one hand, it can go back and use what is already online in social, on online social media and reactivate that in the event. And still also the event can continue after it has sort of already uh, ended. And then the last uh, thing uh, I would like to point about the characteristics of online media and, uh, and, uh, and events today, it's about space, not about time, but about uh, space. Because of course, we all know that online social media and online digital media are globally interconnected. And that adds another kind of, of spatiality to events. So again, television, televised events, they took place here and now, they could then be uh, sent during the, uh, or through the television network. But now events are not only limited to be, to unfolding here at a here, uh, at a specific space, um, but they can also take place there because we can simply just combine uh, sort of where we are located in space. So it is more like a, a global, global interconnected space in, where, in which you sort of have the event. 
So in that sense, any local event and any event is always local, but it and local event may relatively easily become uh, more than a local event. It can become a regional event. It can become national, or even a global event, although it is very, very local. Again, we have this scaling, uh, uh, as I talked about before, from big to small, uh, from now to back in history and on in the future. And now it's a scale between very, very local to global. And, and all these sort of scales are, uh, are supported by, by the online digital media, and they sort of enable it to happen. So if we go back and have a look at this uh, thing I presented before, if we look at the distinction between the pre-planned and the unplanned events, we still have the pre-planned ones. We have royal weddings, we have Olympics, we know that when they will happen, we also have the unplanned ones, disasters. But then we may have something in between that is in a way sort of planned but not really we really do not know exactly when it has to happen and some political elections actually have that at, at least in denmark we can uh, our government can call a, a general election every at any time uh, they want to and then we have the election and they the election goes for four years and then there has to be a new election so we know there will be some sort of election within four years but we don't know exactly when so this, uh, this is an example of a sort of pre-planned event that is not totally planned. So it's sort of an in-between between the pre-planned -pre and the unplanned. And the war, you could say that the Ukrainian war was not an event that was sort of we knew would happen, but there were things pointing in that direction. <laughs> so there is, for the unplanned events, in some cases at least, there is this sort of lead into the event. The totally unplanned event, like a natural disaster, a volcano that explodes or something like that, or I don't know, anything like we had the tsunami, for instance, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. That was really, really unplanned. But you could say that you, the, the Ukrainian war was not unplanned totally. You had some sort of things that could sort of indicate that it could become an event. And that's also important to know when you want to archive it, because maybe you should already start your archiving there at that time. And of course, that also goes for the other distinction between the media independent and the made for media. We may have some uh, in-betweens here uh, where the media independent events, because people can start writing about it and do stuff with it, can become also made for media. So basically, this, uh, this small table here should indicate that um, that the table I just deduced from Diane and Katz is with the digital media is sort of becoming a little bit more fluffy, a little bit more, a little bit less precise. So there's something happening with the digital media that makes it a little, a little bit less um, sort of sharp distinctions in it. So uh, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to focus more, more on here is of course um, things that is sort of pre-planned and moving toward the unplanned. The pre-planned pre -plan, pre -pre events are a little bit more easy to handle, basically. So if you want to read my, my reading and, and sort of trying to develop Diane and Katz's book, you can have a look at this article here. It's called Media Events in an Age of the Web and Television, Diane and Katz Revisited. And it is in this uh, journal here, the Nordic Journal of Media Studies. Uh, issue volume four issue one that came out uh, a couple of months ago you can just search on the web for the title and then you, you can find it so that's if you want to know more in detail about how, how i do this uh, rereading of diana Katz. so now i'm going to focus on my next point my next major point the methodological challenges when archiving an unplanned event i use unplanned in, in a parenthesis because it is sort of well, it is sort of unplanned, but you may know that it will come in a way. So there are uh, different strategies for collecting these uh, unplanned events. Um, so one thing is the one thing that you could do, you could just sit and wait until the event happens and then not be prepared. I would not recommend that, but it is a strategy. You could go for that, um, but uh, I think uh, most, most people could do better. But that's definitely the, if you haven't done any sort of archiving or collecting of these things before, then, then this is probably be where you start. <laughs> uh, you just sit there and, whoa, something happens and it, you just have to get started. So since it, especially with the unplanned events that have sort of a lead into the, to the, to the event, 
that that's where you could be a little bit more prepared. So that would be my, my, my second strategy to establish some sort of what I call contingency plan. So you have it in your drawer, you have prepared it and it describes what to do if or when an unplanned event happens. And that's, that's, uh, that's definitely the, the way I would do it if I were sort of uh, trying to do, to do some archiving. And you can have that uh, sort of contingency plan on two levels, uh, on a general level and, and on a more event specific level. So on the general level, you could, you could list some must archive websites and social media, irrespective of the nature of the event. So no matter what kind of event, you would probably need to archive some media outlets that are important in your geographical uh, location. No matter what the event is about, it will probably at some point become part of the media circle. So I would definitely have them on my list. Polit politicians, uh, political parties would probably also be relevant to have on your list and you can just continue that list. So there are at least some, some actors that you could have on a list that you would definitely like to archive no matter what the event is actually about. And then on the other hand, you could also as part of your contingency plan have uh, some event specific levels and they're, they're very, they're much more difficult to, to plan because you don't know what the event is actually going to be about. So it could be strategies for expanding this, the general list with some more specific, uh, some more event specific nominations of actors, could be websites, social media profiles, et cetera, et cetera, that could be included. So I would definitely go for having a contingency plan that's so that you're ready when an event happens. Something that you already know could be the sort of the general approach that will sort of fit all types of events. And then something where you should be ready to move fast when the event is about to start to find out where to, where to find uh, information about this event. And I'm going to kind of dig, dig a little bit more into these two uh, in, in my last part. Also for international events, if it's something that is at any, at, in any way related to the web, you could uh, use or be part of international initiatives like the IIPC, the International Internet Preservation Consortium. Uh, they are very likely to start um, uh, an event uh, archiving and they have done that and also is doing it with the Ukrainian war, but they did it with the COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also a very, a very big player to sort of team up with if you can. So then to uh, the practical challenges, the last part of my presentation here. So what are the practical challenges if you want to sort of use this, this, uh, this methodological approach or these strategies? So you, I, I'm going to identify at least three practical challenges. Of course, the first one is to identify what to include. Uh, I'm going to uh, elaborate on, on, both, on all three of them. So the first one is to identify what should be included. Then you have a sort of the collecting phase where you have some technical challenges, legal, maybe ethical challenges. And then uh, the sort of the last point is making what was archived available. And then again, you have some technical and legal and ethical challenges here. How should you make it available for whom and when? So I'm going to go through uh, these three practical challenges, each of them one by one. So the first one to identify what to include. Um, that's basically a, a matter of the implementation of the content contingency plan. And on the, on the general level, I would say uh, the operators here should be the curators of an archiving institution. Uh, they should establish and maintain a list of must archive websites and social media that should then be revisited from time to time. So that they have a list up front. We need these and these and these uh, media outlets. We need these, uh, whatever it should be, maybe official um, ministries or departments, uh, maybe some universities, et cetera. So that's something that you would definitely need in all events. So I would say if you have a bigger archiving institution, that would definitely be something for the curators to do. Uh, and if you're a small institution, you should at least um, appoint someone to do this job. And then uh, at the event specific level, I would, and, and that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult. You should uh, find out how you want to expand the general list that you already have with the more event specific nominations of actors that you would like to collect. 
and it can be an actor can be anything like from a website to a profile or several profiles on social media. So how to do that? How to come from this very general uh, list to the more event specific one? It's it's of course a difficult thing because you don't know what the event is about, and events they sort of change uh, the the people you should approach depending on what the event is about. But uh, a way of doing this. Um, is very, very simple in, in, in a way, but it's also extremely powerful. Uh, it's, a, it's a very technical approach to expand your list of what you should include. I call it hyperlink snowballing. So it's simply, it's very simple. You start with just uh, 10 uh, very important websites that you can identify related to the list, and you can probably do that quite quickly. Then you pull out all the links of that, uh, of that actor, if it's a website, you take out all the links and then you put them into your, in, in your archiving software and then you go out and get what they, what, they, what they have sort of pointed to. And then you just do that two, three, four iterations. And then you suddenly have a huge, huge list. I've done that a couple of times. You start with five websites and just without uh, doing much, you have 5,000. And that's, then, then yeah, that could be your, uh, either you, if you have the, archiving power, then you should just archive that. And then you can sort it, sort it out later on. Or if you don't have that sort of much power to do the archiving of, of many, many uh, websites and social media profiles, then you may have to find out which are one of them should you go with. In general, it is less, less costly uh, just to go and archive it compared to trying to be more detailed in what you want to archive. But again, that's something that has to be weighed. Is it better just to get some, if it's the web, get some web addresses and then go get all of it? Or should you, if you don't can do that, cannot do that, then should you go and, and, and do a more selective thing? You could also use what I call a citizen science inspired approach. And that would be establish contact to relevant stakeholders in the event. It could be people in academia who do research about whatever the event is about. Uh, very, very good play, place to start. Could be, of course, people with a stake in the event. Um, depending on what the event is, that, that will, of course, shift. So you should, in a, in a way, be a little bit prepared of who would I contact if it is a natural disaster taking place in my own country? Who would I contact if it is a terrorist attack in my country? Who would I contact if this and that? And you can then start with them and then have them report back to you what they think should then be added uh, to the collection. So that's a sort of a citizen science inspired approach. It's sort of, you could say it's a, it's a human, uh, human uh, approach of the hyperlink snowball. It's a sort of snowball approach. And then of course you should also decide if you want to evaluate the nominations, uh, just as I talked about before, do we want to say, okay, uh, this is a good nomination, this is a bad nomination, or just want to go with all of them? Again, the, the most cost effective is to go just with all of it, because it takes some manpower to evaluate that. But again, it, you have to balance that yourself. Uh, then in the collecting phase, you have some practical challenges there as well. Um, of course, before the event happens, you have to have a technical setup. And it's, of course, if you, it's the first time you do it, then you don't have this. But then for the next time you have it already. Uh, and it should be, of course, a technical setup ready for use to be used for digital online media. Because there are different challenges, as you all know, for if you want to archive the web, if you want to archive Telegram, if you want to go for Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram, whatever you want to go for, uh, different, different ways of, of doing that. And that, of course, sets some, some limitations for what you can actually archive. But again, at least you have to have something up and running uh, before the event happens. Also, if you want to go uh, the nomination way, uh, that is involve people in helping you to make the collection grow, then you should have a nomination tool set up. And uh, the IIPC, they have one already. It's, it, it can be extremely simple. It can just be a Google sheet where people can put in a, a URL or whatever they could put in, and you just have that. And it's extremely easy to set up, but you can of course make it more, make it more fine grained and much more yeah, useful in many ways, but, it, but you can get quite, quite a long way uh, with very simple tools. But at least you should 
if you want to have nominations, you should be ready to receive them, basically. And then, of course, you should have a legal setup as well, uh, because uh, what are you allowed to archive uh, in your national setting? And based on your institutional uh, commitments, what can your institution archive? What are they entitled to, to, to collect, et cetera, et cetera. That should be in place also before you start, of course. And of course, there may be some ethical challenges as well. As if possible, they, sh they, sh they should be debated beforehand as well. So if you have all this ready, uh, then, then you're ready, uh, ready to go <laughs> and just sit and wait until something happens. And then last point uh, about making uh, what was archived available. So it is also good already when you collect it to think about how you would make it available. Because uh, have an idea of how you would make it available, especially for whom, and especially also when you will make what you have archived available. That all depends on how you, what, what you have in terms of technical decision in, in the archiving. Does it actually, well, the way you archive it, does it allow for making it available quickly? But it can be a good point to make it uh, available very, very quickly, especially, or maybe even while the event still unfolds. Because then you can inspire stakeholders to nominate new things if they can see, okay, they archive this and that, we can see what is already in the archive, and then they would suggest that you also add this and that and that. Uh, again, that demands some technical stuff and some all the legal stuff and all that should be in place. Uh, but if it is possible, it, it could really, uh, it may help getting a more fine-grained uh, collection of what is what can be collected uh, if people can see what is already being collected. If you cannot show it all, maybe you can just show a list of if all the profile names and all the websites, all that, you just can show a list that we have already got these, you don't have to nominate these. That in itself can also be extremely uh, helpful. So that was my last slide. And this slide is just um, a splash screen from, uh, from uh, the website called wagnet.eu. I don't know if you're familiar with the project. Uh, I'm heading this uh, international research network called Wagnet. Um, yeah, some of you I can see, and Frederic Claver, I could see he was in the audience and he's part of this project. Uh, so what we do in this project, we do a lot of great stuff, but uh, what we also do is that we have had made interviews with uh, national and other archiving institutions related to the COVID-19 uh, event. So how did they do it? How did they select? Uh, why did they archive this and not that? Uh, what was the result and how are they making it available, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see here, the ones that are highlighted uh, are these, um, these interviews with people at different archiving institutions. As you can see, if we start from, from uh, the bottom right, we have the Hungarian Web Archive, the UK, the Swiss, uh, the IIPC as well, the Icelandic, uh, the French, the BNF. We also have the ENI in France. Uh, the Dutch and a couple of others in the top, which I cannot see here because there's, there's a bar here. But anyway, you can see which ones uh, we have here already. And this is just a, a small fraction of the list. We, I think we have turned 16 or 18 interviews now. So if you want to get some, some sort of, yes, yeah, some, some inspiration for what, what national web archives have done related to the COVID-19, you can just go and grab these uh, for free download and you can just uh, go and get them. So um, they can hopefully give you some inspiration. I think that was the last slide. Yes, it was. So that was what I had prepared. So ready for uh, input from you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Berger, for really interesting and um, informative presentation. I would suggest that um, you stop sharing maybe the screen yep, now. Yep. I will. There we go. Uh -huh. And um, we can start with our Ukrainian colleagues. They can mm -hmm. first ask their questions and then the rest of us, if we have any questions, we can jump in. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'll probably start with uh, some comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Brugger, for this uh, outline of uh, 
of your take on uh, online media event and digital online media. I was uh, during your uh, talk, I was uh, basically trying to uh, apply your typology uh, of um, okay. online media event and uh, digital online media on the case uh, that is uh, basically uh, uh, yeah, here on table for us, uh, what we are doing uh, with this Telegram archive, but mostly about the online event and how the war in Ukraine, uh, the Russian invasion is, uh, well, uh, how we would define this uh, in the context of, uh, of this typology that you proposed mm. uh, uh, in your presentation. And uh, I think it fits uh, in many cases because we have this idea of pre-planned and unplanned event. And for the war, uh, I totally agree that we can put it in somewhere in between in this gray area because, mm. uh, well, for me, it wasn't planned event at all, but uh, <laughs> Well, there are people who planned this uh, from, for a long time and they had this uh, in their plans. So basically, this is a kind of mixed thing that someone had it in plan, uh, basically, and this event happened because someone was planning that. Maybe if uh, not uh, here in Ukraine, we hmm. were, well, aware of, of something that is coming, but we didn't expect it as, as planned, as something planned. So even for war, we have this like planned, pre-planned, unplanned mixed mm. situation and also about your uh, idea of uh, media independent and uh, made for media events uh, when it comes to the war i was asking myself whether this uh, war in ukraine but probably uh, any other contemporary uh, war uh, globally either them those wars are media independent or uh, they actually made for media as well, because what mm -hmm. I can see from even Telegram archiving, but not only uh, from online media in general, I can see that uh, this is kind of hybrid thing, uh, this mm -hmm. war. It happens not only on the battlefield, uh, on the front line, uh, uh, somewhere north of Kiev or uh, mm -hmm. south of Kherson, but also it happens online. It mm. happens and uh, it intentionally happens online. So media here is something that is basically is considered as another dimension of the battlefield mm. of the warfare. And I think this is also made for war. I mean, made for, uh, for media. Made this for war, media, yeah. This war is made for media as well as for this physical dimension um, on, on the battlefield, on the ground. Uh, and it starts from the, not only from the, I don't know, cyber attacks on the Ukrainian mm. uh, uh, governmental uh, digital infrastructure or financial infrastructure before the invasion started, but also when the, uh, was, there was this uh, speech made by uh, Putin uh, in, the, like, in the first hours of the invasion. This was very specifically a media event and made for mm. media and made it as a part of this war. Uh, so I think this is kind of uh, like this totality of this war uh, combines uh, the physical dimension and media dimension as well. Mm. So I think the war is made for media as well here. Mm. Um, and uh, basically, when we try to um, mm, try to preserve it, try to archive uh, this uh, this event, what is happening? You mentioned about this hyperlink snowballing. This is basically the way we started doing this. Mm. We just okay. started. Uh, we decided we like we. Uh, define the list of channels that we want to collect, but then uh, we just through the referral hyperlinks uh, went to other channels and other topics that we want to collect. And also people uh, with a stake in the event, in the context, uh, we are the, ourselves are in the context very much. So uh, this is also part of our archive, archiving practice, being in the context of this event. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, I was curious, uh, mm, uh, about your, um, maybe you can comment that somehow on the uh, war and media event, because for me, as far as I understand, uh, like terminology definition of the event, this is something that starts, that has a beginning, it has an ending as well. Something that has a like, kind of strict or definitive chronology, time, uh, mm -hmm. timeline. And, uh, mm, and for such a thing as war, 
uh, um, it's some, sometimes it's even uh, there is discussion when the war started but uh, mm -hmm. let's say that the start of the invasion 24th of February is the beginning of this of this event let's say that we mm -hmm. also archived mm -hmm. here uh, but at the same time we already started archiving some pre February 24th uh, channel because we see that the context some sometimes is uh, much more present regarding the beginning of the war uh, mm -hmm. in the those channels uh, before the February 24th so the beginning is more or less uh, as uh, defined, let's say, but the end of that uh, is basically no one knows when the war mm. will stop, what is the end of the war. Uh, and there is also, I mean, not only here in Ukraine among colleagues, uh, but we have often these discussions about what we should consider as the end of the war, mm. uh, whether it's uh, ceasefire, peaceful agreement, uh, what what should happen to call this war as something that is uh, uh, that came to an end. And uh, I'm asking that because uh, it is also a question for us in our archiving practice, because uh, from the very beginning of uh, collecting this material, we were asking ourselves, when should we stop? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the, the end point? Uh, what would be the uh, this, I don't know, milestone or like condition where we can say that uh, mm. uh, the scope that we defined for this archiving uh, setup is completed and we can say that we uh, collected uh, as uh, well we collected material that we can call uh, the telegram archive of the war mm. uh, uh, so this Do is to go with that and then then you can continue uh, uh, yeah sure yeah Okay, good. Yeah, so it, it's it's a very pertinent question, and 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 uh, it, it's sort of I, I didn't say much about that, <clears throat> but both uh, the beginning and the end of an event is in many many cases sort of not a point in time, but more a period in time. It's sort of a period in time where it sort of begins, and then it certainly begins more and more, and then it is really begun, and then that's also the thing in the end, it sort of fades out maybe it becomes less and less, and then it may end eventually. Just to give you an impression or just an example of that with the COVID-19, um, in the interviews um, that you can find in the Wagnet uh, collection of, of, of these interviews that I mentioned, uh, there is an interview with the Danish web archive, NetAcute, and they, um, they sort of explain how they started the COVID-19 um, collection. And that's very often what happens because it actually, they actually did not start when when the pandemic hit Denmark, they started before that, but not because it was in a pandemic in Denmark. There was another story actually, because in a Danish newspaper, there was this cartoon with uh, the Chinese flag, and then all the stars were Corona things. And China didn't like that for whatever reason. Um, uh, and, uh, and there was a huge debate about that. And that sort of was about to become an event uh, of a kind of dispute between Denmark and China about this pandemic that was only taking place in China at the time. So they started archiving it. And then eventually then the pandemic also came to Denmark and then they were already up and running with the, with the archiving and then it just continued. And they are discussing also how, when they should end because the pandemic is still there, but it sort of goes a little bit up and down, you know, with, with, with the pandemic. So I would say when it should stop, I would, I would, I would look at the activity in, in the media that you're archiving, basically. So if, if you go through your, uh, what you have collected and can see a shift over a period of time where the activity on these channels become less and less and less and less about the invasion, then I would say, okay, now it's sort of dying out in a way. It may come up again because <laughs> things may happen that sort of re reinvigorates uh, the events and then you should be ready again. Uh, but you can have this going in a little more like, like if it was a computer, you, it, it will go into sleep mode and then you could press a button and then it comes up again. Sort of that way of thinking of it. So follow the event. Um, in the media and see how if, if there is no more activity then there is it, it becomes repetitive because you really not get much new stuff and then be ready if it sort of gets up again does that make any sense yes yes definitely it actually uh, for some uh, at least in our archiving practice for some of the 
channels or archiving items mm -hmm. that we collect, we can already see that uh, partially they or have less activity or mm -hmm. become less uh, repetitive, uh, or I mean become repetitive more, more, on yeah, more yeah. repetitive on the topic. So uh, it, even visible in some uh, channels. But at the same time, we in, at that moment we decide that we can switch our focus to something else. If this mm -hmm. channel does not uh, cover the topic of the war in the same way yeah. that it was uh, from the beginning of the invasion, and then we might even probably try to look at other topics, other channels, yeah. Uh, yeah. because the, the very case of the war is so huge and uh, mm. basically covers any part of our life. You mentioned that yeah. uh, you should, like, but there should supposed to be some contingency plan where you can prepare a list of must archive websites, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them might be not that much relevant to the topic of the archiving uh but still interesting to the archive in our case mm. everything is covered by like affected yeah. by the war uh, yeah, no matter what channel uh, you uh, follow or trace you can mm. see the effects of the war even food mm. bloggers uh, online they are affected by the war and they post yeah, things that are related to the war so uh, you basically especially in this first months of the war you cannot mm. find the top uh, channel or online media that is not mm. talking about the war in many dimensions because it's not only about the warfare yeah. but also about post-war recovery which is like yeah, long, yeah, yeah. long yeah, dura yeah. Uh, yeah, trajectory yeah. of the war and it's yeah, still yeah, part yeah. of the of the topic that we uh, collect yeah, and that's something that you could discuss as well um what will you do with the post-war period once that actually hopefully comes um what will you do that with that uh, but I think your point is 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 very good about uh, if you follow the activity and you can already now see sort of a decrease in activity in some channels. And maybe you can set a threshold and say once uh, we reach say five percent aware of the ones we have had when it was peaking, once only five percent of them are active, then we would simply say okay, that's that's the end of that event. And the, I mean that could be one way of doing it. If and you should have something that that makes it easy for you to find out how much activity there is and and uh, if you can do that in a more technical way that's probably very easy yeah yeah that's a good point uh, that makes sense i have probably one more uh, yeah, fire away. topic or question to uh, to raise and to ask and, and, and while you ask i will eat some uh, melon oh, my great. wife just came with to me so uh, oh, nice. it's okay with you i'll <laughs> sure. put out, take out take away my microphone have a nice meal. <laughs> you have a very good wife. <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, uh, so uh, the to the other topic that I wanted to mention is uh, kind of about the actors that are present in the digital archiving practices because uh, at least from my perspective and from my really short experience of archiving uh, uh, social media or something that you call digital online media uh, i basically can see that uh, uh, this digital archiving practice is something that happens uh, between uh, like several bodies several actors uh, on one hand, we have archivists or archiving institution or personal um, initiative to, to, to archive a specific topic or event or uh, create specific collection. At the same time, we have, uh, uh, well, legal framework, so basically a state or international uh, agreements on uh, privacy data, on uh, collecting and storing data, for instance, GDPR. So basically there is legal framework uh, established by uh, governments, uh, which is another actor in this thing. And if it affects, uh, it really affects uh, the archiving practices uh, um, worldwide. Uh, Again, as well, especially for social media, uh, but not only, of course, we have platforms. We have platforms, and as far as I can see, digital archiving, 
uh, is very much platform dependent. So it really depends on what platform you archive. And you already mentioned that this uh, digital online media, it's very mixing uh, combination of different platforms, different projects, different uh, websites, uh, channels, and so on. TikTok, Twitter, Telegram, website, uh, blogging platform, uh, so on. So like it's very mixed combination. And it is always dependent on what platform uh, you're focusing on. And uh, you need to basically adjust in your archiving practice to the platform. You need to have a permission, technical possibility to collect uh, some material. Uh, you need to adhere a privacy policy of a specific platform and so on and so on. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, here my question would be about the platform. Maybe you can make uh, uh, some comment on that. How platforms and those who are responsible or running those platforms uh, in digital online media, what are their roles in digital archiving platform, uh, digital archiving mm -hmm. practices? Mm -hmm. Should be should they be involved, engaged more into this uh, uh, into this effort, especially when it comes to emergency archiving, when it comes to uh, mm -hmm. events like uh, natural disaster, COVID-19, or war in Ukraine, uh, whether those platforms should be somehow feel their own responsibility to, mm -hmm. to not only take down some, uh, I don't know, graphic content or uh, some content that violates their privacy policy, but also uh, to create an archiving setup for uh, preserving specific uh, mm -hmm part of the legacy related to the yeah. uh, to the event to the online media yeah. event and uh, last uh, point about that is there is this another actor as I can see or mm -hmm. well at least I would call it like that that we have authors mm. Mm -hmm. many cases we call them users uh, but they not only users they maybe use the platform but they create the content and sometimes they do not have their own uh, uh, agency in that. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, collecting this data and when we talk about the preserving this data and sometimes when people post something or publish on the website or make some uh, a photo, publish it on Instagram or somewhere else, they might be aware of the um, kind of uh, like privacy policy and might mm -hmm. be aware that this content goes public but they might be not aware of a possibility to preserve it, to store it. So, uh, mm -hmm. I mean that uh, they, w when I publish something online, I might be aware that this could be visible by to anyone, but I wouldn't be thinking about uh, someone collecting it into the archive, someone storing it and preserve it uh, as the part of the mm -hmm. legacy. So well, maybe you can make some yeah, comments. Yeah, I, or, I, uh, on consent, on consent of preserving online media, and, and we we have and we have to to stop a quarter to four because I could probably talk for hours about that, <laughs> but it's a very very good I would say a group of questions uh, because there's so much uh, into that. Uh, but a way of framing it, it, hopefully that can help you a little bit uh, to 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 make it in a sort of a systematic way. Um, you have if you imagine a triangle, you have three things you have to balance. And you already or touch touch upon all of them. You have uh, privacy issues, and that would be GDPR and all that stuff. That's one kind of group of of, of questions. Then you have uh, copyright, which is another group which you didn't mention that much. But copyright is also a challenge. And then the third leg in that triangle is the terms of service of platforms. If you remember what I talked about in the beginning about the web and social media, the beauty of the web is that it does not come with terms of service. So you can just go and get it. The web in terms of the terms of service, there are no terms of service issues related to websites in general. There may be some exceptions, but in general, the web is, is sort of public and, 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 and you can go out and, and archive it. Uh, but with the social media, they have terms of service kind of telling you about what you can do. So that's, that's one thing you have to have in mind, these three uh, parts of, of these three groups of questions, uh, privacy, copyright, terms of service. And then you have two ways of approaching them because it can either be in a legal discourse, meaning what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? And it can also be in an ethical discourse. What is it good to do and what is it not good to do? 
And it depends on which, which, how you frame the question. Are you asking a legal question or are you asking an ethical question? Some these boundaries may also not be that clear. But if you could start with a legal question, and we sort of go through the triangle in a legal way, uh, copyright is is um, in some ways the most easy one to do because um, it depends on how the copyright is in your country. It's not regulated above the country. It may also be if, so if it's someone outside of your country, but you have you have legal frameworks for copyright in each country and they're not sort of transnational. So that's in a way the most easy one. Um, as it is in Denmark, uh, everyone who publishes anything in any media of any kind uh, has the right to republish it. So it doesn't have the right that it can be read, but has the right to republish it. So that means that I cannot take something from someone's website and then put it on my own website without asking for permission. And that probably goes for the same in, in your country. And then you can always ask, is it okay that I take this in my archive? Ways of kind of workarounds is that, okay, you put it in your archive, but you do not make it publicly available. You make it available for a restricted number of persons, for instance, researchers. So that can also maybe way, be a workaround around the copyright issue. We then go to the, to the GDPR and the privacy issues in a legal framework or in a legal sort of discourse. Um, there are exceptions in the GDPR. I don't know if Ukraine follows the GDPR or no, but anyway, uh, it's out there. And, 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 and there are exceptions for archiving institutions and for researchers. And it's, uh, it's the, the articles nine uh, and article six, and it's a sub, subdivision 2E <laughs> that uh, states this in, in its article nine, subdivision 2.E or litra E as it's called. And it's in the six, uh, article six, I, I think it's one of the points below that. And what it stated there is that if, if, the, if the handling of the data and handling is a very, very broad term, but that's the one that is used. If it is for the benefit of society, then you are allowed to do it. And all archiving institutions, libraries and the like, and researchers are considered for the benefit of society. So that makes you home safe. You can, you can collect the data, you can treat it, you can do with it, but you still have to inform the people that you archive. And that's the challenge. So what we have been doing um, in Denmark is that it, we put a, um, a sort of a disclaimer on the website. Uh, once we do that, on if we have a project website and say we are archiving these tweets, we then put a, a disclaimer saying we archive these tweets, this type of tweets. And if you do not want to, then you could just contact us. We put you out. And that uh, that has been uh, accepted by by the legal staff. Um, and this one way of doing it, if you have a legal framework, um, sort of from your government, as the Danish Nedaki would have, they do not have to inform because it's written in the law that they are entitled to do this, no matter the privacy. They handle again also the privacy in the access. So again, the access is where you can where you can sort of say, okay, we can decide who can get access. If it's researchers, then if a researcher, I as a researcher get access to the content of the Danish web archive then I become responsible for handling the data, although it is archived by the archive institution. And then it's me who has to sort of, well, adhere to the GDPR. Then the last triangle thing, the, the terms of service, uh, they vary from, from, from social media to social media. And uh, you have to, to figure out what they write, basically. If it's Twitter, uh, and if it's in Europe, they say it is okay, uh, to archive what we have uh, what we have done or what's on Twitter, but you should follow the GDPR in terms of privacy. So, so Twitter is, I would say, the easiest one. I don't know Telegram enough to say how how that works in terms of that terms of service. Facebook and Instagram may be uh, more tricky. Uh, you all know the Cambridge Analytica scandal, so they they are more. Uh, I, I really don't know exactly what they do, but I know that the Danish Web Archive they collect Facebook and Instagram as well, and they collect TikTok as well. Uh, but they are also entitled to do that. Um, so, and then of course, then the last thing would be the ethical issue. So that's when you drift a little bit away from the legal and say, okay, I, I am actually allowed to do this, but do I want to do it? Um, and, and that's sort of another discussion. My approach is that go and get an archive, it, 
archive as much as possible. And then once you're going to use it, then you can have the ethical question. So if a researcher comes to your collection of Telegram and there are, I don't know, posts by children who really don't know what they're actually saying, et cetera, et cetera, then that researcher would probably hopefully say, okay, I have this, I could use it, but I'm at least going to anonymize it or I'm going to do this and that, which makes it sort of ethically correct to use it. So that sort of is a way of framing these very, very relevant questions. You have uh, copyright, you have privacy, you have terms of service, you have legal and yeah. I don't know if that could, could help a little bit. Thank you, thank you very much. So now it's, now it's up to you to find the answers, but that's a way of framing it. <laughs> yeah, so Bodan, like did you have anything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I have more Join general, uh, since I'm not uh, archiving you know, web and digital mm. media. Uh, but I am very much interested in epistemological uh, issues. And uh, in general, while you were talking, I downloaded your article and look it through. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. <laughs> For bringing media events since I studied television and it's, uh, okay. yeah, it's uh, uh, very relevant to what I'm doing. But you, you say that uh, like media events now can be treated as a specific genre. Yes, so it's kind of, part of television history and now when it comes to web it should be kind of modified uh, mm. uh, though very often everything media we call i mean everything on the web we call media also <laughs> but uh, my question mm. is uh, not about this but about uh, of this epistemological approach like and you are also struggling with this as to my to my humble knowledge so it's like how we define what is history when we combine all these things together, uh, like invasion of Russia and the start of this so-called operation or the war, it depends on the mm. side, took place on the 24th of February. So this, this kind of starting point is already in this big term, which we define as history, yes? Mm. But then all other smaller things, like smaller events, when it's... Uh, when we dealt with with historic media like television, television has this idea that this is a flow, as you said, like television is a flow and it's it can record, it's kind of a window to the world. It can record the exact event. And then the web is a bit different because it has delays. It's a bit different in many various aspects. And so to simplify, uh, my question is how, how how you, 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 you personally uh, select in those multiple archives, like these terabytes of information, what is actually historic event? You know, everything is historic, of course, but mm -hmm. then how do you make selections? Mm -hmm. Like epistemologically, mm -hmm. how history changes when we deal with such, with such various, various data sets? Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, really, a tough one. <laughs> uh, I, I would go back and do as I would usually do. I mean, uh, I, I would start with having a research question, something that I would like to know. And then I would use that as my lens, uh, my way of selecting my tool for selecting. So I would say, as I do my, myself, I'm studying the Danish web and its history from, 2000, uh, from around nine, 1995 to 2015. So uh, whatever can help me answer my research question uh, would be a reasonable source to, to pick up. And that could be minutes from a meeting written on paper. It could be uh, the websites as they have looked, could be lists of what websites were on the Danish web at any time, basically anything I would say. Uh, so I, I do not, there are some, dis, some, some differences between uh, digital sources and non-digital sources, but, at a, at a more general level, they're, both, they're all sources, basically. And then, of course, we have to have the same approaches in terms of source criticism and evaluation of what is the source and how is it a good source? Can it help me answer my research question? So I would not see them as that different, but there are differences in a way still, because uh, I've written substantially about that, that the web is, is a weird source because of its archiving. 
So it becomes something that has, in many cases, not existed in exactly the same form when it was online. But that's 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 a big difference. But it's uh, it it has this sort of doubleness of being a source, but it's a particular type of source that comes with some challenges that we then have to address. Yeah, I don't know if that was yeah, kind yeah, of a. That's, uh... I also assume the questions start first, <laughs> but we, uh, very often we need to tell our students also some kind of, uh, because they, they often approach us and ask like, you know, how history changes now, mm -hmm. you know, how do you define what is important mm -hmm. or less important, mm -hmm. because besides your questions, they still believe in this kind of ontological kind of mentioned that there is the history itself mm -hmm. <laughs> besides mm -hmm. professors. Kruger or besides <laughs> Nicola Mahorte. So there is kind of some flow of, of mm -hmm. events. Uh, yeah, and yeah. of course, they're, they're, the difference to, to, to say 30 years, 50 years ago is that much more of, of what is going on in society at any level is now preserved. So that's, of course, make, make, makes sort of the, the amount of possible sources grow extremely much. I mean, it's, it's just exploding. I don't know how many hours of YouTube that is uploaded every second. It's, it's really out of scale big. Uh, so that's, that's, of course, a difference in its own right. It, we probably had as much talk uh, 50 or 100 years ago, but it wasn't recorded and it wasn't kept. It was just talk between people, spoken language. But now the spoken language is still there, but it's sort of doubled by something that looks like spoken language, but is then preserved. At least much of it is preserved. So, so that's, of course, makes... You could say the gross list of what you could make a source is extremely big compared to say 50 years ago yeah we are suffering from the abundance of sources. yeah 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 <laughs> you, you probably know the the article uh scale scarcity and abundance and this, this is the abundance thing yeah. which again then comes with the scarcity because there's also a lot we do not have so if Taras hadn't archived all this telegram then we would have a scarcity there Although we have an abundance within other fields, so so it it comes with with with, with both. Yeah. Thank you. I can see there's something going on in the chat. Um, maybe it's Frederick or something about Facebook. Anyway, if any of you have any questions, you you just fire away. Nicola. <laughs> Yep. So first of all, Nils, thank you so much for the great lecture. It was just such a pleasure, really great insights. I really have a ton of questions, but I expect that some people <laughs> might also have some. So I will okay. just shoot two of them. Good. So my first question is about uh, the typology of Diane and Katz and also on your take on this one. Mm. Uh, would you also say that we might think about adding the authenticity component to the whole typology of the events? And generally, what mm. would be your idea about the role of authenticity? Especially mm. nowadays that, you know, we have a lot of deep fake events. We are also mm -hmm. having a lot of imagined events, which are not necessarily true. And I think it's definitely the case also with the war in Ukraine, where mm. I would say, especially yeah. Russian side, definitely loves imagining events. Mm. And I would really love to hear your thoughts about what uh, is the place of those imagined events in the general typology of the media events, but also very practically. Would you also say mm. that it's something that we should archive? Mm. And if yes, then shall we actually treat them equally in our archives compared mm -hmm. to, let's say, our authentic events? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should and, I go with that first? And then you yeah, can take the yeah, other one? Just, just okay. go with <laughs> uh, uh, be, yeah, Because I, I would definitely say yes. Uh, you should definitely preserve all the forgeries and all the things that are really incorrect or deep fakes or whatever it is. Because if you don't do that, then we can never write the history of it, basically. So, so that would be my, my answer to that. Um, and we do, I mean, if we do not have it, um, we, we simply cannot evaluate, uh, evaluate it later, what was actually happening. So I would go for, and that's sort of a more princ principal thing, I would definitely try to archive as much as possible. Uh, and no matter who was the actor and what was the content, I would, because we, one, and that's also a very principal thing, today we do not know which questions historians in 20 or 30 years time would like to answer. And we should just prepare as much and, and as good sources as possible, and then it's up to them to, to find out what they would like to know. We have this question now with what happened 50 years, 100 years ago, 
people really love these collections of things that went wrong or didn't work well or it's and all that and, and and again it's it's we should definitely keep that and do what we can to do it because it again it makes it possible for us to to write that history and hopefully to to become more smart in a way um so yeah i would definitely go for that and that's again the authenticity that's where you started um is it was much easier with television because then the broadcaster was sort of guaranteeing the authenticity and that's again what i talked about with all the new producers of stuff in the digital media they they then of course the authenticity authenticity becomes at stake here but try to keep as much of that as possible yeah next question <laughs> so maybe we'll go for the second one which is more practical mm -hmm. can you tell uh, us also a bit more about um, your practical take on dealing with the legal challenges so basically, uh, what is your, I would say, recommended path of actions would be? So mm. is it the best way, uh, if we are thinking about the potential of making of archive, is to mm -hmm. go to, let's say, the university legal department and start talking to them? Is there mm. an international consortium of archiving which might be of help here? So mm -hmm. how you would actually recommend approaching those mm -hmm. legal aspects? Because yeah, I personally yeah. feel that that's actually one of the things that we're struggling for almost always the most when yeah. we're dealing with the online economy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, the legal stuff is a showstopper <laughs> in many, many ways. So um, depends on your national setting and, and, this, and the context you're in, because I have experienced that many, many, many times during the last two decades, that if you ask uh, a le the legal staff, is this legal? You can definitely be sure that the answer is no. If you don't ask them and just do it, you may be able to persuade them later that this was maybe not legally okay, but now it is sort of okay and we can continue with it. So something by, 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 by showing, by doing could, could be one approach forward. And uh, I, and again, I experienced that so many times because this is so new to most people who work with legal stuff. They're not familiar with this collecting and uh, making available and uh, all this sort of cultural heritage thing. Even in the cultural heritage institutions, they, they also get a little bit anxious. And we had sort of that experience uh, at, with the Danish Web Archive, which is part of the Royal Library here in Denmark. And um, as a researcher, I came and I would like to get access and I could get access because I was a researcher, but they were very, very restricted about it. Um, and then they changed, uh, the staff changed. So in came another one, another, another person who were, who were working with the same staff. And then suddenly we could have things extracted, which is amazing. So you imagine there is one petabyte of Danish web in the Danish web archive. I can contact them and I could say, I would like to have these three websites extracted, what you have for all the years of these three websites, it is extracted and then it's transferred to a secure server environment at my university. And then I'm responsible for all the GDPR stuff and all the copyright stuff, uh, but it's possible. And that is sort of th something that just happened because staff changed. And then it was suddenly possible. I mean, the law didn't change, but, but, but staff changed. So it's another way of saying that it's actually a matter of who you ask. Um, so take care to ask the right ones. <laughs> and then you have, of course, uh, other, other countries where they have, haven't, have, haven't been so, so successful in a way. If you, if you go to the Netherlands, they have very apparently very restricted copyright law. So their web archive is based on, on legal agreements between the web archive and the holders of the copyright of the websites, which is the reason why the Dutch web archive is fairly small. They're doing a great, great job. Uh, you can find some, uh, some of the interviews I mentioned in the, at the end of my, uh, of my uh, presentation, you can find one of these uh, Wagnet papers that is with the Dutch web archive. And they explain a little bit about that as well there, but they, they base, they are based on on copyright and that's one one way of, of doing it the other one that we have in denmark and they have in the uk and in france uh, is so-called legal deposit i don't know if you're familiar with the legal deposit system it was invented in france in 1650 ish uh, 1650 ish 
And uh, so it says that every everything that is published in the uh, in the kingdom at the time uh, of France should be handed over in one copy to the king's library. And we have the same in Denmark. They have the same in the UK. So we have this huge collection of anything that has been public published in Denmark going back to 16 something. And and that that way of, of, of seeing it was extended to also, of course, exclude other way or include other ways of making things public in, for instance, as it's called in the law, computer networks. So, so that's why NetArchive in Denmark, they are entitled to go out and archive whatever is made publicly available on the Danish web. And that's what they do. And again, the Dutch, they have to have a signed contract and all that stuff. And then you have um, Portugal, which is, and, and Croatia, which are even more strange because they just do it and they make it openly available online like that. And then they have an opt out uh, approach. So if people would not like to be part of their collection online, everyone can see it, they can opt out. So these are sort of the three main approaches, either going for copyright or contract thing, having a legal deposit. And then you of course have to have legal framework in your nation to do that, or they're just doing it and then opt out. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that was sort of a, an answer. Okay. Okay, so we have 15 more minutes. Yeah. If anybody has any questions. If there's anything in the chat that is relevant, I cannot see or read all of it. You uh, can even have a look. Not not questions, just okay. a very interesting comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> comments. Yeah, 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 that's good. Fair enough. So maybe I can ask a question. So Terrace, maybe for, mostly for you, how, how is it going <laughs> with the archiving? Oh, uh, it's been going. You sound, you sound tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uncertain, rather. <laughs> ah, okay. It's been going for like how many? Four months already, and uh, we have a group of uh, archivists, uh, basically of people working on that with me. And uh, when we started, we actually we didn't have any idea how to do that. Uh, we didn't have any technical skills or background to archive uh, it uh, in automatic way. But we were lucky that Telegram itself allows you to download anything from any chat or channel uh, uh, manually uh, in uh, JSON format or HTML format. So it's pretty liberal in terms of uh, um like the, uh, allowing you to download uh, uh basically anything from from uh, from the chat so we basically had to decide what what we sh want to uh, archive and what we do not want to archive and as you mentioned in those two dimensions legal and ethical and we still uh, keep struggling with defining what is uh, private and public and uh not only in legal uh, uh terms but also like what is our ethical approach methodological then uh, to to archive public and private what we decided that everything that is basically published and is not a closed group or personal communication between people uh, mm. could be considered as uh, something that was published online but mm. still i can understand that basically uh, anything that was published people who published that they do not uh, they might be aware that this is public but mm. they might not be aware that this could be preserved somewhere else yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, that, that's if i can just throw in a comment there because that's that's where i would i would opt for the just do it and then in the access you can sort of handle that because then the researchers who are going to use it afterwards they should of course be aware that okay this person really do do not know that it's actually public so maybe i should use it in an ethical correct way yeah uh, that's, that's at least one way of doing it that's great because advice. It, it, it's it, because it's very very difficult to find out uh if people really know that it's public and then if you do what to do with it you, you may have a thread where you can see okay this one doesn't know but this one really knows that this is public and then what the hell to do with that so I, that's again an option or a, an argument for 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 capturing as much as possible and then handling it in in the access phase yeah that's the great advice actually and i think we will uh, on the level of access on the stage of setting this access for the archival material we will uh, probably should do that in that way but we also were thinking that we could probably uh 
uh, yeah, we also document our decisions. We document what mm, we are doing good. in order to uh, bring uh, the researcher in future, bring the context of how it was collected, what were the questions, mm. decisions, and the context, general context of what we are doing. We try That's to document important. the process. Uh, so probably from that, it will be also visible uh, how we define this idea of private and public uh, with the context of this arc uh, very particular archive. At the same time, what we were thinking that we might do as well is uh, that we could probably try to reach out uh, the administrators of those channels uh, mm. or the chats itself with the um, kind of a disclaimer uh, yeah, that yeah, says yeah. that uh, this very particular channel was archived and stored mm -hmm. for this and this purpose under this and their circumstances with this and these yeah. conditions to access and in case uh, 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 the administrator of the owner of the content or those mm -hmm. who are affected by this content that was posted uh, in that chat or channel uh, would like to opt out, uh, take down mm. uh, the material from the archive, then we respond to that by deleting uh, this particular uh, mm. item, archival <laughs> item from, from the archive. So this was... It, it, yeah, it's, it sounds um, an okay thing, but it is a little bit tricky in the sense that would we do that with newspapers? So someone wrote a, a letter to the editor in the newspaper and then found out, okay, it was published and I don't like it now, two years later, I think, I would ask you to cut it out. You'll probably never accept that. So it's <laughs> it's tricky in that sense. But I, I definitely can see that that of course people are, may not be aware. Um, so there is sort of a middle thing between opting out and and then deleting because uh, they do it in the Internet Archive as well. So if people ask to be uh, to be removed, they are mm -hmm. removed from the index, but the content is not removed, and that's the difference. So you can simply just keep it. And then if they want to be removed, they can be removed. And if a researcher then comes and say, I would like to see it, then it's up to you to say, okay, you may have access to it, but the person who did made it would not like anyone to see it, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, because then if the person comes uh, two years later and says, okay, I don't bother, you can publish it anyway, then it's nice to have it. Uh, and, and they have done that with the Internet Archive because way back in 2010, I was writing a small article about the first five years of Facebook's history. I went to the Internet Archive and there, they had Facebook.com in the archive. And then uh, five years later, I was about to write an article about the 10 first years of Facebook. And I went to the Internet Archive and it was taken down. Mm -hmm. So there was no copies of Facebook in the Internet Archive because they had asked to be put out of the index but it wasn't deleted because when then I came back five years later again, and it was there again. <laughs> so so it's it's just a way of saying that maybe you should not throw it out, but you delete it, but you could make the access sort of closed. That's another That's great a, advice. A middle, a middle form. <laughs> yeah. There is also a possibility that uh, I mean, you, in these Telegram channels, many people use uh, uh, some others. Uh, plenty of content without any permission mm, uh, so, yeah. so i can assume that there will be a third party asking yeah, the yeah, archive yeah. to remove specific data which they mm. don't want to see this even though they were downloaded from yeah. <laughs> another that story. is a huge problem yeah and, and that's where the legal deposit it, it sort of solves that because uh they can archive that as well and still be within the legal framework um, mm -hmm. But it, it is a sort of a jungle because many of the things that you can find in social media, but also on the web, is maybe pulled in from other sources and uh, where the copyright is not clear. And people do not care about that, the, the people who publish it. Yeah, copyright issue is another thing for us because we have a lot of content, uh, visual material that are we, basically it is not even possible to define the copyright in the open. No, in no, the exactly, world. and that's again an argument for for just just collecting it and then handling it in the access process. So you can say, mm -hmm. okay, this you have to you cannot at least republish it because there's a, the copyright yeah. is not about collecting it; it's about republishing it. Reproducing, yeah. Yeah, so so you can you can collect, but you cannot reproduce. Yeah, that were really great advices. It was this nuanced access and uh, opt out policy. Yeah. yeah, there are some workarounds that could be worth uh, thinking more about. 
So do do plant actually you you ask another question which I now remind that I didn't answer. Uh, you asked about the the platforms uh, mm. if they should do something themselves. I wouldn't be too optimistic on that uh, because it's really not what they consider their job. Uh, they are there to earn money, and that's what they try to do. And messing around with all that old stuff, they really don't care. Uh, but for us, it's it's extremely valuable historical sources. To them, it is data with which they can make money today and tomorrow. They don't care about the past unless they can use it to make money today. Uh, so I wouldn't be too optimistic there. And you can you have a, actually a an example of that. Uh, you may know all of you the the Twitter archive uh, that was at the Library of Congress at some point. Uh, Twitter they donated uh, I don't know how many years of tweets to the Library of of, of our, Congress in the US, and they never succeeded making it uh, available to people for various reasons, technical organization or whatever. So it's now sort of just, well, I don't know where it actually is, but it's really not available anymore. And, and Twitter, Twitter in a way changed then, I think it was partly because of that. So now, you, as, as you know, the Twitter developer account, if you have one of those, you can actually go and get easily old tweets. So Twitter has, in, have in a way, offered this um, this this access to old, to the historical tweets, which is really really great. But again, I would I would rather have those tweets in my own ar archive than I would have them at Twitter. <laughs> Twitter uh, and social media. I mean, today we couldn't imagine the world without Twitter and Facebook. But if you look at something called MySpace, uh, Second Life, I don't know if it still exists. But at the time in 2004 and five, that was the thing. We, we couldn't imagine the world without that, but social media, they come and they go. And I would rather have that on a server and a, and a national archive institution or something similar. So I wouldn't rely too much on the, on the platforms. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time, there's uh, because of their importance, they're getting getting more and more responsible for, I don't know, public discussion and some mm -hmm. public policies. In the case of Cambridge Analytica that you mentioned and Facebook, it's uh, another proof of that, that basically mm -hmm. they're not only responsible for earning the money, but uh, now maybe unexpectedly for them, for many more other issues and preserving the legacies mm -hmm. might be another, um, I don't know, another perspective for for them to consider, uh, but mm. I, I agree totally with you that uh, we shouldn't be too optimistic about uh, <laughs> those commercial platforms that uh, they somehow uh, mm, themselves decide to to preserve the content. Uh, yeah. the so I would say it, it's, it's simply too too risky <laughs> to, mm. to have them do that. Uh, I would really like some some national institutions that think in a perspective that is well basically eternity. Mm -hmm. So it's preserved for eternity in, in, in national collection, national cultural heritage institutions. Mm -hmm. if yeah, we are approaching uh, yeah, the end, yeah. I can Your see. Time. <laughs> yes. I, mm, I don't know, I have a really small question and but it's- Far away it's, in Paris. It's not uh, basically related uh, to the topic of uh, of our talk. That's why I'm hesitating. But uh, let's really make it small. It's, it's still related to your experience and your background because it's about history of web. And I was uh, curious. And uh, first mm -hmm. of all, thank you for this uh, um, uh, issue series on the internet histories that is very much mm -hmm. important for the historiography of uh, internet and web, mm -hmm. and which is very much interesting and. Uh, uh, this is also part of my uh, interest, so I'm uh, mm, I'm really happy that it ex exists. And my question is related to that because in the historiography of the web and the internet, there is this, uh, there was this discussion about the I don't know USA uh, centered approach to the history mm -hmm. of the internet that switched uh, a little bit or a lot, uh, and mm -hmm. we now have a lot of histories from the European continent. And my question, mm -hmm. but probably it should be really short um, it relates to the uh, to the topic on the historiography of the internets or the web uh, from this part of the world from the eastern mm. europe from ukraine do you consider it somehow visible or important that would, that would be really interesting i mean there is this book i know i don't know who what's his name uh, it's about the russian internet 
Yeah, Peters. it's Ben Peters, yes. It's ben Peters, yeah, uh, at MIT Press. And there are a few others. We published some, I think, uh, and some are actually in the pipeline about, I think it was also the Russian internet, but I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. But it could be um, definitely about, yeah, it, it's up to you how to make that split about, I, would, I don't know if, if, the, if the term Eastern Europe still makes sense. Of course, it does in a geographical <laughs> sense, but in what sense it does, I really don't know anymore. But I mean, it's, it's, if, if we get a proposal for that, of course, we'll have a look at it uh, to see if it's, uh, if it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, there's definitely not much about it out there, I think. Yeah. So, and that in itself is a good argument for, uh, for having that. And, and as you know, we, we have had this, the last one we had about sort of a, a geographical location was about Asia, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and why not? Uh, I don't know how you would frame it, but but you, it's up to you to do that. Could, yeah, I don't. I really don't know how to frame that. It could maybe be somehow, for better and worse, related to the, the disappearance of the Soviet Union in a way, because yeah, the yeah. Soviet Union sort of disappeared when the web took off in a way. Uh, so how yeah. did that actually play out? Yeah, basically, uh, cybernetic legacy, infrastructural and scientific legacy very much affected the, the internet and web uh, mm -hmm. in this part of the world. So yeah. probably post-socialist or post-Soviet. Something like that. Yeah, something like that could be sort of a framing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just go ahead, find some colleagues and someone to do it with, and then uh, send a proposal. You can go to the website. We, we have a description there what a proposal should look like for a special issue. So uh, yeah, great. Yeah, you may have some in this group here. <laughs> great thank you yeah yeah we should probably finish <laughs> hey, thank you so much professor Brueger. this was amazing this was also the perfect conclusion to our workshop series and thank you everybody for your amazing questions very stimulating discussion and a very happy birthday to your wife uh, from all yeah, thank you enjoy uh, thank the you rest. very much <laughs> enjoy <laughs> your evening thank you so much everybody i will yeah Thank you. Okay. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.